Hello again, friends. We are back to part two of the marketing mix, and that is place, distribution, retailing, such an important part of our economy, and looking forward to getting back to a some sort of a normal world of retailing where we can go to the stores that we enjoy so much and purchase the products that, uh, that we like. If we look, we've just looked at Walmart, Amazon, eBay as uh, the survivors right now in going forward in the retail world, but hopefully many stores will survive too. We'll just have to up our game. Grocery. I don't know how many of you in the class do your grocery shopping and pay for your groceries. I would say a majority do. This is something that uh, that we, we love. If we look at food, you know, food is maybe the most intimate relationship that we have with any product. Uh, we work, we need it, uh, we love to, maybe some of us love to cook. It's a, it's a very intimate relationship we have with food when we really break it down. So, where are we shopping? Again, in the food area, there's not a lot of profitability. That's why uh, uh, you have spoilage, you have... Uh, high turnover and returns and so it's a, it's a small profit margin. Uh, what's happening to the traditional American grocery store? That, kind of that middle that middle of the America, you know, the Kroger, the Albertsons, maybe that Tom Thumb. What are we doing? Well, we're going the wrong way. All right, there we are. Has Walmart taken a big piece of grocery? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of you may not be able to remember, Walmart was just a department store, was just a Kmart mass merchandising. They saw where they needed to go to get you to stay in their store. So on a given week, according to Consumer Reports, the average consumer will shop at five different stores on a weekly basis for grocery needs. So we can see how this pandemic, uh, Tarrant County just got the order to shelter in place, and that's going to be tonight. Today is March 24th, 2020, so at 11 p.m. tonight, only necessity stores will be open. I believe the majority of these that we're looking at will still be open, uh, but most will have to provide some sort of a delivery uh, or, or pick up at the curb. So here we are. We like variety. Uh, Central Market, what a one amazing store. There's our natural grocer, which is located just down the street, literally on Highway 26 from the Northeast Campus of Tarrant County College. Walmart's right across the street. We have Sprouts, we have Trader Joe's, we talked about that. Maybe you go to a farmer's market. We like a lot of different items. That's why I say food is so intimate. We, we really want the best uh, that we can provide for our families. And so, should be a very enjoyable experience. I don't know how many of you are buying online your groceries pre this uh, pandem uh, uh, disaster pandemic, excuse me, that we've gone through. I have bought a lot more online than uh, in set up Kroger accounts and uh, Whole Food accounts just just to get it here. So will this change as well? Everything is kind of getting very new on us. Will we still love to go into the stores or trust that it can be shipped to us? Do these survive, my friends? Does the mall survive by the year 2030? That's a great question. The mall is where so much of American culture we like to call them the temples that we go to, to, uh, to vote. Don't we vote at these malls? We vote with our dollars, absolutely. Again, your standard you know, the department store had multiple brands, multiple departments. We've seen much more fashion. But who does survive in the next 10 years? Yes, they can do online. Does Dillard's now need to think about different ways of delivery, like Amazon? Again, it's, it's taken tradi traditional retailers so long to think about what Amazon has done. Sure, we can use UPS. Sure, we can use the United States Postal Service. But... What about other vehicles of delivery, literally? Uh, will some of these Pennies and Dillards and Macy's and Nordstrom's, will they start using Instacart uh, and, and, and travel that way home, uh, to your home? Will they have their own delivery service for local pickups uh, that you can just get in a day? I think they're going to have to uh, amp it up more than just waiting for a week to get that product. We know the mass merchandisers, all right. They 
came on in the 1980s and have certainly not stopped. There's Target and there is Walmart. Again, volume, volume, volume. These were very interesting. These were the category killers. These kind of killed the small businesses, the small bookstores. You know, maybe this was some of the demise of Radio Shack where you could buy all of your electronics. Uh, what are they being killed by? The Internet. So, how long do they survive? I hope Barnes & Noble survives. I just enjoy going in there and looking at books and, uh, and relaxing using their free Internet. Costco. I don't know if you're a Costco member, but uh, they are the second largest traditional retailer behind Walmart. And it's a very interesting experience. You can sometimes buy way too much because you just see so much stuff uh, throughout the uh, throughout the store. It's really a warehouse. Uh, but great brands, uh, very interesting, and they have a, a, a very good online ordering system as well. And you know what? They can take your membership away. Be careful at a Costco. Well, years ago, years ago, when I was at the Arlington Costco, somebody in front of the line, you know, you're in that line. This lady is making up a man. She is just going all after it, yelling at the um, at the cashier because the, I don't know price or it was was different. But she thought it was a different price. But it was it was getting ugly. Very very calmly, a manager just steps in line and says, "Ma'am, I'm going to take care of you." And she goes, "Oh, okay, yeah, you better take care of me." And so the, you know they bring him off to that to that offshoot uh, on the, just to right across cashier. And he refunds her total money and takes her card and says, your membership has been canceled. You are no longer welcome at Costco. And then it got, no, no, you can't do that. No, they actually can. And she was escorted out the, uh, out the building. Uh, so don't mess with them Costco workers. Convenience stores. Hey, 7-Eleven, another great Dallas-based business, started 1926 right before the Great Depression in Dallas, Texas. Uh, a small little convenience. In fact, I think it was started out of a house of the Southland family that uh, someone said, you know what, I don't have a car. I need to bring in some more money uh, for, uh, for my family. And uh, I believe it was a mother, and she had her children basically running around delivering items that uh, other people couldn't get. And so it became a convenience. If we look at a convenience store, we see, you know, they take the the ten percent of the top selling items uh, in a major store, mark them up to a thirty percent higher price because you can go in and out so quickly into Seven Eleven. Limited amount. There is something that Walmart tried, and they got out of it. When we look at the psychology of our grocery purchases, the biggest bulk happens Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. That's when people get paid or people get off work, and so they do their majority of their shopping. Monday's still a pretty good-sized day as well. Traditionally, in traditional retailing, Tuesday has been the slowest day of the week, which is why, for some reasons, a lot of companies did businesses will close down. That would be their day off because they knew their sales were, were, were uh, not so great, and that was in the traditional retailing world back in those 80s, 90s, and even early aughts. But Wednesday is that refill during the week. 30% of all grocery shopping happened right in the Wednesday, Thursday, and now, you know, some of Tuesday. Um, so Walmart wanted to get into kind of that dollar store format, maybe a convenience format where you do your quick pickups. You don't want to go into the big Walmart, even the neighborhood Walmart. You want to go in and out. They closed all 100 stores in 2016. And, and they only had them open for a short period of time. So a lot of analysts just thought, Walmart said, you know, we couldn't get our margins, we couldn't get the volume, it wasn't making the money that we thought we were going to have. And uh, because people were still expecting low prices at, at Walmart uh, in, in the uh, 7-Eleven type of format. But some analysts believed, again, that maybe you pulled out too quick. You, you just should have kept it going because this is a big area where people want to capitalize, especially grocery retailers, how to get that 30%. And again, maybe that Amazon Go is going to go right after that amount. Deep discount. You know what? Since that 2008 recession that we had, these have been the fastest growing retail segment. And that's what definitely Walmart wanted to compete against because traditionally 
this market would maybe hit a Walmart, but the Dollar Tree, Dollar General, five below, uh, their net profit margins are 7%. So that's a very, very attractive. That's after everything, my friends. That's after all expenses, salaries have been paid. Your, your net income margin is 7% of sales. That's a very, very healthy, healthy number. So on a test, what's the fastest growing retail uh, segment? It's going to be your dollar deep discount stores. Another very interesting retail phenomenon is Tuesday morning. Where was it founded? You got it. Dallas, Texas. It was a you know executive from another company that did a lot of international importing and you know he worked with the suppliers around the world and said, you know what? Uh, sometimes I, I see this supply that comes in and I think I can sell it, but I, I, I don't want to invest in a lot of brick and mortar stores. And so what this company did, he founded the company called Tuesday Morning. And basically throughout Dallas, just at different times of the month, they always opened on a Tuesday. He would find vacant retail space. He negotiated with the landlord and say, hey, you've got open space. I've got some product coming in. I will rent two weeks of space for me from a month. And uh, he negotiated it enough that you know people were willing to do this, certainly in the 80s when retailing was overbuilt. So Tuesday morning, Tuesday would start his sales and they would go for like four or five days. And that would basically would be emptying the warehouse. Now what Tuesday morning purchases are basically uh, name brands, they're just overstocked or surplus items. So you get name brands in there uh, for a very low cost. Now, of course, they're open all the time, uh, 24, well, not 24 seven, but seven days a week. And they have their all, if you want to get the best stuff on Tuesday morning, every Tuesday are their new deliveries. And so that's how they've kept that Tuesday morning going. Every Tuesday, you'll have your brand new deliveries in there. You find some very cool stuff for, for low prices. And my advice to you, because I love Tuesday morning, there's one right down on Harwood Drive in Bedford. If you see something you like, especially for those of you getting your own apartments in your home, you got to get it that day because it will be gone the next day and they don't carry a lot of inventory. Again, new stuff comes in all the time. But that's a, an off-price retailing, very interesting form of, uh, uh, of a business and, and they've been doing very well for literally the past 30 years. What happened? What happened to Sears? Probably the best question to ask is who is their customer? When I go into a Sears, and I don't think you can anymore because it's closed down throughout Texas uh, late last year, but when I did, it reminded me of 1970s as a little kid. You could walk in, nothing had changed, at least on the downstairs item. Sears did try to become more fashionable. And it basically looked like a, a store my father would go into because he would get his Black & Decker uh, tools and craftsman tools and uh, maybe a new lawnmower once every five years. And that was about it. They didn't change. They were the number one retailer. Friends, we've looked at Kodak. We've looked at Blockbuster. Okay, now we're looking at Sears. Three organizations that dominated, that owned their industry and are now a f just forgotten who cares about them companies. They were the number lar world's largest retailer from 19, literally the, the uh, late 1800s to 1987. This was Amazon, the Sears and Roebuck catalog. If you were out on the wild west or in the prairies or in the mountains, wherever you were, you could get something from Sears. Uh, again, it wasn't a very fast process, but you could get that catalog, get what you needed, uh, take it to a uh, mercantile, all right, the uh, general store. It would be ordered and delivered to you. Jeff Bezos said, what happened to Sears could happen to Amazon. If we lose sight of the customer because they owned it, we have to be great every single day. Let's look at some of the stuff right there. The brands, Craftsman. Uh, that was sold to uh, Stanley Tools in 2017. Die Hard Batteries, those, yeah. <laughs> those were great, great batteries. That brand has been sold. Kenmore is a household appliance name. Land's Inn, actually that was a Sears company. They had spun that off and it's been purchased. And again, 
if it was, you know, as of last year, it was, still was in business. It closed out uh, late, late summer to early fall. Had you ever purchased anything from them? Again, what they did, Sears bought Kmart. You know, uh, if you're two losers, let's just, let's just, let's join together. Kmart was the Walmart of their day, and they just sat there and watched Walmart eat away all of their customer base and just almost did nothing. And they did. They're, they're, they're bankrupt. Even if you could go in, everything looks so outdated. You know, it was so old. This is what I put in last spring. Will they be around next year? Well, they didn't make it. Again, buying another loser's uh, mass merchandiser, they lost $10 billion in the last five years. Uh, they had 700 stores that were still open, and they were in tremendous bankruptcy. You know, they had a Sears appliances store. They did well, and during that time, the majority of all appliances were bought through, through the Sears company. Again, they were just hitting $4 billion a year. So why didn't they just stop selling fashion, go to a smaller store front, and still do what they did best? I asked the question, what would you do if you were the marketing director three or four or five years ago? How could you have turned Sears around from products to placement to the complete strategy? Now, what's interesting is the Sears CEO who bought Sears uh, in, I think, 2013, is named Eddie Lambert. And Eddie Lambert is a billionaire hedge fund operator. And what he also did, and everyone is blaming him for the demise of Sears, but as we go back and look at some of these great brands, his hedge fund company bought the majority of them, uh, Die Hard and Kenmore. Kenmore was worth five billion dollars just the brand in you know 2013 2014 his hedge fund company bought Kenmore for about 50 million dollars I think he it's a different way of taking over an organization where you buy a a dying business but it had great brands and you liquidate the company but save the brand so he can spend those off that's going to be interesting to see because the company is completely gone. They thought uh, he was a complete disaster, but he still owns some great brand names. And how can they be repositioned again? You could sell those brand names off to Lowe's, Home Depot, because Kenmore still has that uh, that that great uh, craftsman again, that great uh, uh, diehard batteries name to it. Interesting. Goodbye, Sears. What Amazon tried to do? They tried to do this. They said you could buy your, you know, this was something a little little too good too late. You could buy your automotive parts, especially tires, and then have them on at Sears. Now, the Sears Auto Center, I believe, is still, in, still working right now. So, wouldn't this be amazing uh, for Amazon to say, you know what, they're the Amazon Auto Center. Buy your stuff on Amazon, and, and we'll fulfill it uh, right in here. Someone's going to get that. And it's going to be interesting who does. Because Amazon is definitely looking into getting into traditional retail, but, but not giant stores, something very efficient where they can, again, push their product through. Or, you know, again, you can pick up your Amazon products, certainly your larger products. You don't want your tires on that front door. You don't want a car on that front door. But what's to stop Amazon from selling cars or big ticket items, which, which you can find? Interesting, interesting, interesting thoughts. All that mall space, what's going to happen to it? You know, that these are, goodness gracious, 100,000 square foot stores that now have to be, you know, cut up and redesigned. So malls are going to have to spend a lot of money to, uh, to reconfigure what those stores look like. Retailing, my friends, it is going through a hard evolution process right now. Location. We always want that in price. Those are the three L's of retailing, location, location, location. The four L's of real estate, another location in there. There's the host-parasite relationship. And this may be a nice little test question for you. Again, there's Dillard's. Hey, there's a Payless. Hey, there's a boutique right there. Do you think that these stores pay a little bit higher rent or a lot higher rent if they were located next to Sears? Again, people are walking into Dillard's 
this is the host in biology there's the host parasite relationship and so uh, these stores feed off this traffic that comes by and you can look at that in your strip retail centers you look at where stores are going to be located closer to a Walmart or a Target or a, a, a big name retailer so they can just kind of suck off the traffic and maybe we'll walk in there and, and buy some items and buy your products. That's what we call the host parasite relationship. Three L's of retailing, my friend, that location should be accessible to the target market. That's where it's got to be. You know, it's got to be consistent with the retailer's positioning. So we have Sophia's food truck. She's mobile, so she can hit the great Fort Worth parks. She can hit Dallas parks that have uh, uh, are geared for food trucks. Could she come on the Tarrant County College comp campuses and maybe get a little better food than Subway offers? Uh, what should she do? And again, how should she promote that too? Now remember, Sophia's going to do well because you are guiding her. That's why she's going to do so well. She also may want, and this is just what Taco Heads has done in Fort Worth, and if you're not familiar with Taco Heads, they're off Montgomery Street, right across from the uh, Bass uh, Cowgirl Museum. So they're in the, near the museum district, I-30 in Montgomery. And they were a great food truck for many years, and now they have two brick-and-mortar locations in Fort Worth and Dallas. So you might want to take a look at that. That's what Sophia wants to model. She wants to have that food truck gain a lot of support, gain her followers, and then sometime in the future actually have a brick and mortar restaurant in addition to her food truck. So where do you think she should locate that? Should it be Dallas? Should it be Fort Worth? Where in this area do you think would be a great idea for her? Again, uh, for vegan food too. Hey, maybe she could put that food truck um, on Montgomery Street. I'm sorry, Magnolia. Avenue, that's where Spiral Diners is. That's a very, as we would call, bohemian street of just cool restaurants, cool shops, very, very uh, boutique-ish. And there's some land. There's this little old uh, uh, kind of a trailer that sells houseplants. That got me going because uh, I'm an old landscape man. So somewhere down there, maybe she could park that truck. Maybe that would be a cool place for her to have a restaurant. I'm just thinking out loud. Decision making. I put this in here because, friends, you're going to be the decision makers for a long time. Location, location, location. We are in part of North Richland Hills and Hearst. There's a Richland Hills as well. Did you ever wonder why there are two cities? Back in the day, we're back in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, there was just Richland Hills. And Richland Hills wanted to pride itself on being a small bedroom community, very low traffic, just a you know, nice and peaceful area. Well, there was part of the city that said, hey, uh, the airport is coming in. We're prime positioned to be a very growing, thriving city. There's a mall that wants to be built uh, that, that we're hearing about. And, and, and we want that to happen. Well, the older people were vehemently opposed. No, 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 you're going to mess up what we are. So the long story short, North Richland Hills was annexed from Richland Hills. So they took the land, North Richland Hills got to decide where they wanted it, and where they have it now, of course, is where the Northeast Mall is. If you've seen their new city council chambers, it's pretty amazing. North Richland Hills is doing so much uh, and has a, has a great economic development activity. Richland Hills, well, had a self-fulfilling prophecy. They're just a small little bedroom community. They have almost no land to expand. They finally just got a restaurant, I'm sorry, not a restaurant, a, uh, a grocery store a few years ago. That was the Walmart small little neighborhood grocery, which they just begged Walmart because they had nothing. So they have very little tax base. It is an older community. Wow. What do you do? Halton City, again, uh, is trying to grow, but uh, you've got people in there who said, no, we, we, you know, we don't want uh, so much development. And, of course, you look at what South Lake was. South Lake was literally an, an old farming community, and it is the most, one of the most expensive real estates in the United States right now. 
these are 50 100 year decisions this decision that richland hills did as a hundred year decision north richland hills got it right if you're a young family and you want to live uh, in richland hills or north richland hills you, you want parks you want development you want a, a, a restaurants you want a lot of things you can do you're going to north richland hills this is something that's coming into our area right now it's called a todd or a transit orient development right through iron horse again we're trying to get much better transportation. We are looking at this area of North Richland Hills. You see so many upscale apartments and townhomes, retail and office space. When you have a, tra a Todd, a transit-oriented development, this is where it's a train station. And a lot of stuff develops right around it. This is going to take you all the way from Fort Worth, maybe even the Cleburne area when it gets finished, all the way through Addison. Now, Addison, Texas is an expensive place to live. Your homes are going to be close to a million dollars. And maybe you want to live out there. Maybe you like the price points of North Richland Hills. And you want to live there. But you don't want to make that drive 635 all the way up and hit the toll roads. I mean, there we are. We're going to Plano and Addison's even a little bit further out. But this is the old cotton belt. So right now we're somewhere down here this is fort worth but you can draw you know you can get that cotton belt that train goes to dfw airport all right i've seen it, it, it it's that again it's more of the dark train that nice um very ergonomic design well the design is it can get you all the way up through north dallas and into plano and then addison so you can still have in this trip by the way uh it's probably 45 minutes to an hour, but you're not driving. You're sitting there being able to do your work in the morning and or listen to your iTunes and, and relax as you're going home. Very interesting. I go back to Haltom City. Haltom City could have been a place that could have had a Todd. They said, no, no, we don't like that. Uh, North Richland Hill says, we'll take two. <laughs> okay, we'll take one to Iron Horse and we'll take the uh, at, at the Bell Station. So again, you're going to be on those city councils. You may be on the board of Tarrant County College someday. The decisions that you make are very long decisions when they become into building equipment and transportation. So think well outside yourself. Don't think, hey, how's it going to affect me? How is this going to affect you know my children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and their friends? How is it going to affect people long term? Retail trends, my friends, right now, Online sales have been small, <laughs> but uh, again, we know this is literally, uh, this, uh, you know, the 12% the to the 88% is going to change. It starts online. Uh, again, 25, 20 years ago in those mid-90s, so many companies went out of business because these people weren't, your little brother's not there, five years old on a cell phone or three years old. A lot of evolution has taken place. We're going to see so much more developments in technology, the driverless car, Again, because the internet took on so well in these late aughts, because you're here, you were not there in those 1990s. This Z and Alpha generation, uh, some of you have had the internet in your hands since eight months old, but definitely, you know, for you, maybe uh, two or three years old, but we know now this Alpha generation, that's all they will ever know is an online world. So we know that this mode of purchasing and just in distribution it's going to be amazing and we've got to have the distribution to back that up well that's what amazon wants to do they want to put drone delivery now wouldn't that be amazing uh amazon owns 40 at, again two years ago 767s amazon knows you're going to order online we've got to get that product to you as fast as possible we cannot do drone delivery in Dallas Fort Worth area because the FAA won't allow it we just have too much airspace between the airports of uh, DFW Alliance Meacham Love Field that uh, this could get in the way but again very very interesting the powerhouse delivery and of course even your eBayers are doing a much better job I think this is where traditional retailers are you know, I don't want to wait a week I don't want to wait 10 days to get my product you want it as soon as you possibly can have it well there's the cover club I've talked so much about so uh, affectionately on Route 10. Please don't don't go there. That's an old die from the 1970s, a Bell helicopter. That's Route 10. 
okay, there's a lot of stuff. You probably don't have the nicest retail stores because you don't need it. This is warehousing. If you're going to design a business that mainly I need to warehouse, maybe I manufacture with 3D printers and I just need to ship it out, then this could be amazing right in here because it's very low rent and it's made for warehousing uh, and manufacturing. So you put all your money into technology. If you're going to be a tech company and, and really not have a retail face, you don't want to buy expensive retail property because like next to a very to a highway or near the mall, et cetera, et cetera, because it just becomes too expensive. And a lot of businesses didn't realize that and were paying triple the amount of, of lease space and rent space than they needed, which would have been perfect here. Put it in technology, not storefronts. Again, does your marketing plan all right have uh, online sales if you're doing your own business? Well, Sophia's may or may not, but we certainly need to have a big online presence for her, don't we? She's got to have every social media where she's going to be during the day, you know, where she's traveling towards, uh, how to book an event online. Yeah, we got to hit that hard. And again, can we pay online? All right, with Square Up. All right, with Venmo, with PayPal, uh, with Apple Pay. Tremendous fu uh, future, my friends. Hey, have you taken an online class? Well, you are now. Again, for my service businesses, again, again, most people are doing it out of their home. So that's all right. You're consulting, fine, whatever. If you don't need a retail storefront, all right, uh, use it from home, okay? Uh, what can we do? Other services, you're physically doing the work. Think of the low house districts and invest in equipment. If you're doing a service business and you're rolling into Plano, to Highland Park, to South Lake, Texas, uh, my old beat up Toyota Corolla uh, probably gets hit, hit up by the police before, you know, to... Uh, 200 feet into South Lake and gets rerouted back out. Now, if I come up with the now Mercedes Benz has their fleet vehicles that are very low cost, actually. Uh, if I roll up in something like this, okay, Mr. Zala, go go ahead and go through. You can go ahead and get your landscape services. So think of investing if you're doing on the spot or on site service work right in here and go less money on your storefront. And if you can do it out of your house, fantastic. Or if you just need to. Uh, uh, park and warehouse a few vehicles and some of your major equipment. Look at the low cost area there and put the money in the face of the business. That will conclude our place, our distribution video. I do hope you're enjoying these. I hope you're able to access them. And that, just like our lectures we'd be doing in class, uh, we're going to finish up our marketing mix in two segments, so it may be actually four segments, four videos, in the promotion, how do we communicate the value? Again, these may be careers that you want to go into. This is what the, this is the, for the most part, people think what marketing is. It's just advertising and PR. I hope so far from the course, you know that that's, that is a very viable part of marketing, but the strategic part is finding that target market and creating amazing value. This is just how we communicate it all. My friends, make it a great day.